Tonight on The Buzz, we are looking at mentoring and audio. We start with Bernard Weiser, president of the newly formed Entertainment Industry Professionals Mentoring Alliance. As apprenticeships in the media industry decline, mentors are stepping in to help careers get started, as Bernard explains tonight. Next, we shift our attention to audio, hardware, rentals, and software. Paul Isaacs is the Director of Product Management and Design for Sound Devices. Tonight, he shares his thoughts on new trends in audio that are shaping audio recording and wireless microphones. Sometimes, you should buy. Other times, you should rent. But how do you choose? Tonight, we talk with Robert Noon, Rental Manager for Location Sound, about how to make that choice. Plus, he shares his views on critical issues with wireless audio technology that will affect many of us before the end of the year. Then, asking a product manager to talk about new products two months before NAB <laughs> is not going to generate great answers. Instead, tonight, Duran Gleaves, Product Manager for Audio at Adobe, shares his observations on key audio trends to watch, the importance of the Dante Audio Protocol, and how machine learning actually improves audio. All this plus James DeRuvo with our weekly Doddle News update. The buzz starts now. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking. Authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current. Uniting industry experts, production, filmmakers, post-production, and content creators around the planet. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. Welcome to the Digital Production Buzz, the world's longest running podcast for the creative content industry covering media production, post-production, and marketing around the world. Hi, my name is Larry Jordan. It probably won't surprise you to learn that I love audio. So that makes me especially interested in tonight's show, where we're combining two things that I really enjoy, helping young people launch their careers and making our projects sound as good as possible. While there haven't been many breakthroughs in how we record audio for a few years, how we get signals from one place to another is undergoing a revolution. It's called audio over IP, and as you'll learn tonight, it's exploding. I first worked with this as part of our NAB coverage last year, where we used the Dante protocol to create multi-channel audio recordings of all our live shows using gear that was not directly connected to the mixing console. This experience was so successful that we're doing it again as part of our NAB coverage this year. While Dante doesn't help for editing, moving digital audio files via Ethernet works just fine, Dante makes a big difference when things are live. Tonight, we'll also learn what other audio technology to expect at NAB, including new applications of artificial intelligence for audio. By the way, if you enjoy the buzz, please give us a positive rating and review in the iTunes store. We appreciate your support to help us grow our audience. And now it's time for our Doddle News Update with James DeRuvo. Hello, James. Happy Oscar week, Larry. And a very happy Oscar week to you. Do you have any Oscar news for us? There is some interesting Oscar story, though, that I find interesting as a camera geek. And that is, you know, being with Oscar, we already know the big winner of the Oscars this year is going to be Aerie. And that's because, once again, for like the fifth straight year, almost every Academy Award winning nominated movie was shot on an Aerie platform. The Alexa Airy models uh, were used on films like Never Look Away, Roma, Green Book, A Star is Born, Vice, Black Panther, Bohemian Rhapsody, and many others. The most popular lenses, though, were interesting. It was a tie between using Zeiss and Ingenue. Those were the two most popular lenses that cinematographers chose. But the big winner is Airy this year. You know, that's interesting. Red gets all the news, but Aerie gets all the shows. 
Well, yeah, that's true. Red grabs all the headlines with its bleeding edge 8K technology, but it seems that Airy is still the dominant filmmaking technology amongst award-winning cinematographers. Red was largely frozen out again this year. Even Panavision got ahead of Red, grabbing two nominations for Black Klansman and The Favorite. Hmm. All right, that's your lead story. What's next? Bach Magic Design is teaming up with USC School of Cinematic Arts for a broadcast partnership. This three-year strategic team-up will give USC use of Blackmagic equipment and software for their Trojan Vision campus TV station. Blackmagic will provide the Ursa broadcast cameras, ATEM 4ME broadcast studio 4K switchers, ATEM camera control panels, HyperDeck Studio Pro recorders, the works. And in addition, the students will be editing on DaVinci Resolve 15. And Blackmagic is also tossing in a select collection of Ursa Mini Pro cinema cameras for more cinematic applications. Well, what's your take on this? Well, I think it's a cagey move on the part of Blackmagic, which looks to help train the next generation of broadcasters and filmmakers. As we move into the next era of broadcasting going into 4K and above, Blackmagic aims to be at the forefront, and giving student filmmakers use of the Ursa Mini Pro for filmmaking will also show them that you can get high performance at a lower price. And when you consider that, again, every Oscar season has had a USC grad nominated for Best Cinematographer since 1973, it's easy to see why why they're doing this. <laughs> All right. Well, you've had two camera stories so far. Can you make it a hat trick? Yes, I can. Nikon is adding 12-bit RAW to the Z series full-frame mirrorless cameras. The update will provide 12-bit 4K RAW output for external monitor recorders like the Atomos Ninja 5, which relies on the ProRes RAW, which isn't strictly uncompressed RAW, but it's close. And other models will use uncompressed RAW uh, with the Z-Series platform. Other features will include an update that includes improved face tracking and eye detection and better autofocus. And the big news Compact Flash Express support, which I'm pretty excited about. From your perspective, what's the importance of 12-bit RAW? For color correcting, RAW itself, it's uncompressed, so it gives you all of the information that you can use. Dynamic range, color science, the whole bit in 12-bit is going to be a lot better for color than an 8-bit or, or a 10-bit. And so I think it's going to be a great addition to the Z6 and Z7. It shows that Nikon continues to be committed to the filmmaking side of the platform. But I think that other killer feature, support for CF Express, is really not to be ignored because it enjoys the same basic design as the XQD media cards that the Nikons use, but has faster performance. I think this is going to take the Z series to the next level. <laughs> Very cool. James, what other stories are you working on this week? Other stories we're following include Atomos has an external monitor for vloggers. We look at whether a boom pole is worth the money or is it just an expensive broom handle. And we also have 10 cameras for under $300 for those looking to take the beginning steps out of mobile filmmaking. And James, where can we go on the web to see the stories that you and your team are covering? As always, all these stories can be found at dottlenews.com. And James DeRuvo is the editor-in-chief of Dottle News and joins us every week. We'll see you next Thursday. See you next week. Here's another website I want to introduce you to, dottlenews.com. Dottle News gives you a portal into the broadcast, video, and film industries. It's a leading online resource presenting news, reviews, and products for the film and video industry. Dottle News also offers a resource guide and crew management platform specifically designed for production. These digital call sheets, along with their app, directory, and premium listings, provide in-depth organizational tools for busy production professionals. Dottle News is a part of the Thalo Arts community, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with resources you need to succeed. Whether you want the latest industry news, need to network with other creative professionals, or require state-of-the-art online tools to manage your next project, 
there's only one place to go, dawdlednews.com. Mentoring is an increasingly hot topic these days, as we'll see at NAB in a couple of months. Bernard Weiser is the president of the newly formed Entertainment Industry Professionals Mentoring Alliance called EIPMA. Additionally, Bernard is vice president for the Motion Picture Sound Editors Organization, which is MPSE, and the producer of their annual Golden Reel Awards, which does not yet have an acronym. Hello, Bernard. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. What first got you interested in mentoring? During a few years, I was asked to be a guest lecturer at a class, in fact, at UCLA. That started my interest towards teaching and students. And what happened is a transformation that is continuing with me, seeing the creativity in these up and coming students that is going to come into our industry. And that's what really led to me actually now teaching and on faculty teaching one course, uh, one quarter each year at UCLA with graduate students. Why did MPSC decide to get involved with mentoring? That's a good question. A little over a year ago, Paul Rodriguez, who was a longtime MPSC board member, passed away. He had a great effect. He certainly involved with our award show, but with mentoring, in fact, and students. So the MPSC wanted to do something to honor him and mentoring was so much a part of him, we referred to him as our ambassador of sound because he was at NAB every year. He was constantly talking about post-production sound and sound editors. And as uh, many people know, sound editors, is, we seem to be a forgotten lot in the <laughs> storytelling and creative process of, uh, of uh, cinema and television. So uh, he was our ambassador. We wanted to do something special for him. And we announced a year ago that we were going to start a mentoring program in his honor. As that program started being talked about by our president, Tommy McCarthy, a lot of other organizations in the entertainment industry started hearing what we were talking about and said, hey, we want in. And it started growing very quickly. In fact, it got so big that it went beyond just honoring Paul, but it started the ITMA, uh, Entertainment Industry Professionals Mentoring Alliance. One of the things with the formation of it is a common problem that many of us in the industry saw but didn't know how to deal with was with the lessening of apprenticeship programs through unions and such. A lot of people coming in the industry were really out of sorts as to how to proceed professionally. So it was very slow learning for them, the change from being a student or being an independent and then working within the professional system, especially the studio system. So the common problem that we saw was this gap of knowledge between the academics and the students and the professional world. And there was a need for that. And this kind of solidified as just something that we could do to help fill that gap. And he was very uh, conscious of that fact. Nobody teaches that. Nobody even discusses that. And that's important. That's important information for anybody coming into this industry. So we become a conduit. Does this alliance simply focus on sound editing? Is it an audio organization, or do you have a broader reach than that? Well, we have 10 industry organizations now, American Cinema Editors, Motion Picture Sound Editors, Cinema Audio Society, the Recording Academy, as you know, they do the Grammys, Simti, an audio engineering society, which is engineering, Hollywood Professionals Association, Visual Effects Society, Avid, and Sound Girls. We're hoping to include cinematographers and writers very soon. Right now, we're very heavy on this post-production side just because those of us who formed this organization are in post, but we're hoping to become much bigger and include all crafts in the entertainment industry. Are you focusing on students or is your focus people who work in the industry who could use advice? Right now, we're primarily focusing on students, anywhere from high school, college, and postgraduate students. But we don't want to leave out what we call pre-industry individuals who have a great interest in entering into our industry, such as veterans who may be coming out of the, uh, the military. We want to definitely include them also. But you're absolutely right. People who maybe are looking to change their endeavors, professionals that want to uh, tap into their creative side more and want entry into these crafts, uh, absolutely they are welcome also. 
Are you accepting mentees now? And if so, how does the system work? Very soon, at the moment now, we're going to start our outreach because we are launching the organization in about two months, as you noted in your intro. Um, so we're going to begin in probably just a week or so, a very strong outreach to local universities, colleges, high schools, and other academic organizations. We'll be inviting educators and students to an open house at Sony Pictures Studios, either the last week of April or the first week of May. Actually, it'll probably be on a Saturday. So how it will work is interested schools and educators and individuals are asked to contact us either through our website, which should go live shortly also, or through a contact for, through our reach out, they can contact us. Uh, and we would start with that organization or school with a panel for Q and A's with selected top level industry professionals, which will begin our role as a conduit of information for the students and these pre-industry individuals. From there, we can set up group mentoring and on a higher level of college and postgraduates, uh, we will do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which would include even uh, shadowing for a few days in the craft that they choose. It's one thing to hook a student's attention. How are you going to find mentors? Ah, the mentors. In our outreach, we, being that all our organizations are top-level professionals already, all the members, uh, we're going out with our colleagues and talking about ITMA, and it is amazing how many top-level people are interested in becoming a mentor. They will go to our website. They will sign up on the website. They will be vetted to make sure that uh, everybody knows that we are watching after that side of things, too. Um, and that's how we will connect them to uh, the mentees. One of the critical issues inside Hollywood, in fact, media in general, is diversity. How are you tackling that? I'm glad you asked. As a new organization, we see the pluses of diversity. It's very different. Right now, diversity is such a hot topic, and a lot of it is to fix problems that we already have in our industry. And that absolutely is very, very important. But here with this organization, we're looking towards the future. These are our future rising stars in our industry. So diversity is a little bit different. Uh, as a new organization, we see all the pluses that diversity has to offer. And when you mix talent from different racial, ethnic, and social backgrounds, and this includes the veterans, as I mentioned before, people who are bringing so much life experiences with them, new stories, new creative ideas grow in all of our crafts. And that, that you know, these crafts that make of our industry, and I don't know about you, but this really, really excites me. Everybody I talk to, I watch their eyes get bigger. Uh, the other night I was talking with somebody from the Academy of Motion Pictures. They're excited, want to know more about what we're doing. Uh, it's, it's the future, and it's just really, really exciting. For people that want to learn more or get on a mailing list to be kept informed as to what you're doing, where can they go on the web? Well, we will have uh, eatma.org, which is E-I-P-M-A dot org. It is not live yet. I would expect from two to three weeks from now, the website will be up, and that is the place to look for information and contacts and the entry into uh, what we are doing. The website is not yet operational, but it will be within the next two or three weeks. The website is eipma.org, eipma.org, and Bernard Weiser is the president of the newly formed Entertainment Industry Professionals Mentoring Alliance. And Bernard, thanks for joining us today. Great. Thank you. Paul Isaacs is the Director of Product Management and Design for Sound Devices. He's responsible for the development and evolution of products for both sound devices and video devices. His background also includes work as an engineer, a product developer, and a musician. Hello, Paul. Welcome back. Hi there, Larry. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm looking forward to our conversation because audio is one of my favorite subjects. But before we jump into it, let's set the scene. How would you describe sound devices? We're a company that has been around for over 20 years, and we specialize in producing mixers um, and recorders and wireless products for the film and TV industry and broadcast industry. Um, we also touch on products for the, for the musician too. Tonight, we're focusing on audio, and with NAB coming up, 
I know you can't talk about new products, but what are some of the audio trends that we are likely to hear about as we go to the show? A couple of things that stand out for me. I still think that there's a lot of growth um, in audio over IP. The technology started many, many years ago, many years ago, but it's in the last, I would say, three or four, five years where we've really seen a rapid uptake of audio and actually video over IP as well. We're particularly interested in the Dante protocol, which is by far the um, world's leading audio over IP protocol. And I think that really taken off because you don't have to be an IT expert to set up a Dante network. Um, it uh, uses like an auto discovery mechanism, which makes it easy for do- devices to discover one another. By virtue of that fact, it's very easy to connect multiple channels Um, over network very easily. Dante is really supported by most of the leading audio manufacturers now. Focusrite, Yamaha, us, many others. So this interconnect between uh, different manufacturers, Dante makes that digital audio interconnect really easy. The fact that it supports hundreds of channels uh, in all directions makes it super simple. So I think we're going to see more growth there and more product which is going to jump onto that audio over IP bandwagon without a doubt you know audio over IP has actually been standardized in the last uh, few years too with a protocol called AES 67 which is really a wrapper that works across multiple different network formats whether it's Dante or Ravenna or others so that is also going to help um, the interconnect between different network protocols although my own personal opinion is that 90% of manufacturers will be supporting Dante anyway, so I'm not sure whether AS67 is going to offer much of an advantage, but we'll see. Well, let me make sure I've got this clear. Audio IP is the ability for us to digitize audio and send it across the network. Dante is an implementation of how that process works. Is that a correct statement? That's a correct statement. And there are multiple implementations, but Dante is the market leader. Exactly. And it's really low latency. You can have sample rates up to 96 kilohertz, a uh, bit depth of 24 bit, and you can literally have hundreds of channels existing on a network going in any combination between any device on that network. And you can have hundreds of devices on a network. So imagine your Dante box, you hook it up to a Dante network with 100 other devices on there, and then you could literally pull off any channel from any one of those devices Um, with a very simple app on your computer. Um, It's actually a free app that Ordinate, who are behind the manufacturer behind Dante, they produce an app called Dante Controller, which is really uh, just a giant um, matrix routing software system. It will identify every device and you can route any input to any output from any device. It's super simple. And obviously, because it's all implemented over Cat5 and Cat6 network cables, it makes it very cheap, reliable, and cost-effective to set up a, a digital audio network. Let's shift gears. There's another term that I'm hearing more about, which is digital wireless audio. Mm-hmm. What's the advantage of digital wireless versus the traditional wireless we've been working with? I don't know if you know, Larry. I'm sure you do. You've heard that there's been... Um, we're really seeing a squeeze on the wireless RF spectrum. There's only a limited amount of usable space in the RF spectrum. Um, Traditionally, the most commonly used part of the RF spectrum is the UHF band, which runs from about 400 megahertz up to about 700 or 800 megahertz. In the last few years, the RF spectrum has been going through a process of auctioning off as cell phone companies and uh, TV companies try and buy and reserve some of that RF space for their purposes. And what this has done is shrunken the amount of RF spectrum available to productions in uh, 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 film and TV and broadcast productions. With that shrinking down, it's become like a real challenge for users of wireless microphones, traditional analog FM wireless microphones, to find space to run their wireless transmissions. Now think of a a typical application, say a theater, um, where they have maybe 20 or 30 actors on stage. 
all of whom need their own wireless lapel mic and transmitter on a separate frequency. If they've got very little space to work in, then the problems of interference between those wireless microphones and other signals in the environment becomes a real problem. So what digital wireless has done is enabled more wireless channels to be squeezed into a smaller amount of megahertz or bandwidth, should we say, um, without losing any quality and minimizing, still minimizing the chance of um, interference between channels of wireless, which is an absolute no-no, obviously. It can obviously cause glitching and audible artifacts and reduced range on wireless systems. This is without doubt a growing sector. You know, many of the leading wireless manufacturers are bringing out products and have been for the last few years, and that's only going to grow. I mean, wireless is such an important part of every part of the production industry. Um, so you have the likes of Shaw who have their systems, Sennheiser have digital systems. We have our own system as well, which we um, uh, released last year. We sound devices, we bought a company called Audio Limited, which is a highly regarded um, wireless manufacturer. We released our first product after buying that company. We developed an, our own digital wireless system, which is right on the cutting edge of what's possible. We can fit up to 20 channels in an 8 megahertz space, which is mm. very high density, with full 20 to 20 kilohertz audio bandwidth and very low latency. Obviously, latency is a, a big issue as far as wireless is concerned as well. There's a lot of development going on in this sector, and we're very much a part of that, and um, it's an exciting area. Sound Devices makes gear for the professional market and really high quality gear. But recently, a university came to me for recommendations on audio gear for student use. What does Sound Devices have that's priced for education yet still provides high quality? That's a really good question. And we have a product range called the Mix Pre series. And this was really our first step into a more budget price market, which and obviously education is very sensitive in that field. Now, the challenge was for us, how can we bring the sound devices known characteristics of really superb quality audio and rugged build to this education and more budget price markets? And that's what the Mix Pre series was. So we were able to do that with some very clever engineering, um, bring out some multi-channel recorder mixers. And these are, you know, very solid um, die-cast aluminum chassis devices that can stand up to being dropped and abused. And we all know that students aren't necessarily the most careful with these types of products. So these products are very solid. But also they have really excellent quality uh, mic preamps and allow the education and the students to really understand how to get great quality with great gain staging. There's also the feature set maybe um, slightly watered down compared to our high-end professional recorders and mixers, but they still provide like an introduction to all those types of features that you would need if you were to embark on a professional career. Things like time code, for instance, um, making a mix, recording separate ISOs, entering metadata, all these things have been included in a more of a simplified way to make it more accessible to newcomers into this industry. Paul, I could talk to you about audio for hours, but we need to wrap this up. Where can people go on the web to learn more about the products that Sound Devices has available? Our web page is www.sounddevices.com. That's all one word, sounddevices.com. And Paul Isaacs is the Director of Product Management and Design for Sound Devices. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Robert Noon joined Location Sound Corporation in 1989. He became their rental manager in 1996. His role is the logistics and inventory of all of their rental gear with the goal of keeping their equipment fresh 
and Current. Hello, Robert. Welcome back. Hi, how's it going? I always enjoy talking with you, and I'm glad that you came back, because this week we're talking about audio. Before we start, though, how would you describe location sound? Uh, We've been in business for over 40 years. We service the production sound needs of our industry, and we carry sales, rental, and service here. So we're a one-stop shop for sound people, and we deal with production mixers and people who gather sounds for news, broadcast, that sort of part of the industry. Well, there's lots of rental houses out there. Why should someone consider working with Location Sound? Uh, just our experience, friendly nature, and the easy, easiest easy up renting from us. We just heard a conversation with Paul Isaacs from Sound Devices about trends that he sees in audio technology that will affect the new gear coming out at NAB. From your perspective, having to keep your gear current, what audio technologies are you seeing that's starting to drive rentals? This year, there's going to be more changes in the RF market than pretty much anything else. The recorders have been pretty standardized for a while. They're linear and stuff like that. They record on flashcards and that type of medium. But what we're starting to see now is the FCC has made some rules that's going to impact wireless market. First of all, they sold off a whole lot of RF spectrum to T-Mobile and them. So anything above, I think it was 618, is going to be moved to T-Mobile and they bought them in the auctions and stuff like that. So now we're going to be in a smaller diameter from 470 to around 618, I think is where the cutoff is. And they're going to be compressed into that smaller spectrum and the RF demands are not going down, they're going up. So these rule changes are going to affect the technology and how we do wireless mics and antenna placements and lowering the power. Before, everybody used to put more power to put more signal strength out. Now, it might behoove people to actually compress the audio, put less power out. Like, instead of putting 100 milliwatt transmitters out, you want to put them on 25 or 50 milliwatts and use antenna placements so you're not running into all the RF interference that's out there now and competing against people that are working on a stage next to you and stuff. So putting less RF power out might help all those situations. That's what people have to change. Before it was more power, cover more area, saturate the grounds better. But with the the compression and stuff like that, it might be less power, more antennas and uh, to help it out. The other thing that they did is the FCC changed the deviation rule for companies like Electrosonics, which was using a, a deviation value of 75, it's now gone to 50. So, you know, you have to make sure your transmitters match up to your receivers. And if you buy newer transmitters, they might not work into your older receivers unless you have the firmware updates and stuff like that. So those things are going to cause a lot of problems because you have people that usually just keep adding on to their fleet and wireless. And now, if they add a new transmitter, it might not work with their backwards compatible as good unless you have all the software updates. And in the rental houses, how that's going to affect us is we rent a lot of pieces into somebody just needs a transmitter to cover a boom pole or something like that. It's a special thing that they're doing or a smaller transmitter. Now we have to be aware that either we got to rent them the older stuff and hold on to that longer than we usually do not go into the new stuff as much, or when we rent the new stuff, rent it with a matching receiver from our side so you know you're not going to have incompatibility. That's going to make it very confusing, and it's going to make it tough for a while and for people to understand what those changes are going to be. For people that already own analog wireless gear, can Location Sound help us figure out if our gear is compatible? Yes. It's more software updates and stuff like that. You just got to make sure you're in the right software update. And it's mostly going to affect the electrosonic span, which is pretty much an industry standard for us. But uh, they're the ones that uh, had the 70 deviation. And now the FCC's rule change has made 50, which is a European standard. So most of the stuff like Sennheiser and stuff were already on the 50 deviation So the biggest people it's going to impact is mostly the electrosonics community, which is probably 80% of the wireless that are in production sound. 
One of the things you mentioned at the beginning is that Location Sound has both sales and rental. How do we decide or what criteria should we use in deciding whether to rent or buy our audio gear? If you think you're only going to use it a couple times a year, less than, let's say, six, then you probably should rent. If you believe you're going to use it six or more times a year, then you probably should add it into your fleet. Also, if you're looking to expand your package and you're not sure which way you go, I would recommend renting the first couple times just to get a feel of what you want to do before you put out that outlay of capital. And a lot of times what we do is if you rent from us and then you buy from us, we give you a discount on the rental, the previous rental. The, the, the biggest thing you have to decide is how often you're going to use it. If you're not using it too often, I don't think that capital outlay is best. The more you use it, uh, the more you want to buy it. The less you use it, the less you want to buy it. I really want to reinforce that because a few years ago, I needed to buy a collection of lavalier mics for my studio. And one of the smartest things I did was rent about 10 different mics from Location Sound, then test them to see which one sounded the best in my studio. Mm-hmm. And what I learned in talking with your team at the time that I was renting all that gear is that audio is foreign territory for a lot of video producers. So what help does Location Sound provide in making sure that we're getting the right gear for our project? You know, when you come in and you explain what you're doing and stuff like that, we're going to design packages that fit your needs and cover what you've told us. The audio quality and stuff like that is also based on budget. So we need to know what budget range you're looking in so we can decide if it's better for you to buy or rent mostly and what you can afford with the budget you have. If you have only a couple hundred dollars, sometimes it's better to just put wireless going in the cameras. Preferably, we would say it's always better to have it going into a recorder. You record it on the recorder and maybe send the signal to the camera to have a backup track, but everything is dependent on the budget. So deciding the budget and what ways they're going, if you're buying or if you're going to rent, the decision that we help you sort of decide, you know, if it's over the weekend and stuff, of course you're going to rent, but then how much is in the budget to accomplish what you want to do, and we try to give you the best products that's going to solve your problem and get what you want done accomplished based on the budget. Mics and stuff like that, a lot of that is preference per a person's ears. That is something, you know, we can give you the different mics and you can listen to them and you can decide which way you want to go on that. That is more preference. Sometimes talents require certain mics based on their voice and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that is more opinionated. And the best thing we can do is give you a wide selection, let you know what's more the industry standard, show you what the industry standard is, and show you the comparable mics in that field and decide what your preference is. Some people like an open mic, some people like a bright mic, some people like a full sounding mic. You know, so there's different needs and requirements for the person, and that is on an individual basis. One last question before I let you go. For producers who haven't worked with an audio rental house before, what questions should they ask the people they are renting from before they make a decision to rent? That's more pertains to how the procedures, some companies have very strict procedures. They need insurance. They do credit card holds on the equipment. And one thing good about us is we just make you fill out the credit card authorization form and we only charge you for the rental. We assume that the card you gave us is what the card we're going to run, and if it goes through, that you have a good credit card. So we don't do like a $1,000 hold or 500 which ties up your credit line. So I would say that's a big thing that I know a lot of people are happy that we don't do that, and it makes it easier to process the order and stuff like that. Ease of operation, willing to work with people, discounts for time. Those are the things that they should be looking for. All the rental houses are very similar in price, but the longer you go out on a rental and stuff like that, the larger the discounts get. And do they carry the equipment you're looking for? For people that want to learn more about the services and products that Location Sound provides, where can they go on the web? Go to www.locationsound.com, and that'll pull up our website, and we'll go from there. That's all one word, locationsound.com. 
Robert Noon is the rental manager for Location Sound. And Robert, thanks for joining us today. Okay, you have a good day too, Larry. I want to introduce you to a new website, Thalo.com. Thalo is an artist community and networking site for creative people to connect, be inspired, and showcase their creativity. Thalo.com features content from around the world with a global perspective on all things creative. Thalo is the place for creative folks to learn, collaborate, market, and sell their works. Thalo is a part of Thalo Arts, a worldwide community of artists, filmmakers, and storytellers. From photography to filmmaking, performing arts to fine arts, and everything in between, Thalo is filled with the resources you need to succeed. Visit Thalo.com and discover how their community can help you connect, learn, and succeed. That's Thalo.com. Duran Gleaves joined the Adobe Audition team in 2004. Now as product manager for audio at Adobe, he oversees audio features and workflows across several Creative Cloud applications and services. Hello, Duran. Welcome back. Thanks, Larry. Nice to be here. Duran, tonight we've heard from Sound Devices, who makes hardware, and Location Sound, who rents hardware. But without software, all this hardware is incomplete. And that brings us to Adobe. How would you define your role for audio at Adobe? Well, my job is to effectively talk to people who are creating uh, audio content, uh, kind of keep an eye out for trends, for uh, changes in, in, in how people start to work and in the way that they work, and figure out how to convert those into features and workflows in the software that can have the biggest impact o- over the most, uh, most num- the largest number of users. Well, you used a word that I love to hear, which is trends. While I don't expect you to tell us about Adobe's coming upgrades much, let's, <laughs> let's take a look at the near future. What audio trends are you expecting to emerge at NAB? What's caught your eye? Well, I'm, I'm really happy about, uh, it looks like the podcasting pavilion is going to be bigger than it's ever been before. Um, I'm a huge podcasting fan. I've been a fan of it for a very long time now. So it's, it's really good to see how, how much it's grown, how large it, largely it's been adopted, uh, and how people are using it, um, not just to promote their stories and their brands, but even to, as springboards to, to larger uh, larger platforms. Um, I'm also really excited about the growth in the voice-based experiences, uh, things like uh, branded experiences and entertainment for Alexa and, and the Google devices. Um, those are just getting more and more, uh, they're just getting better than, than they have in the past, and, and people are starting to do uh, really interesting and innovative things on them. And uh, beyond that, I'm really excited to see what's new in artificial intelligence and machine learning with regards to sound and audio process. Well, I want to come back to artificial intelligence and audio in just a minute. But what makes podcasting so significant to you? Well, for me, I, you know, I don't think it's anything revolutionary to your listeners. It really just democratized the ability for people to share their voice, um, whether that's uh, telling stories that are personal, whether it's talking about historical or, or even current news and political events. Um, it's a, just a fascinating way for, for people to really get out there and, and get directly to the people that they want to talk to. Earlier in the show, we heard both Paul Isaacs and Robert Noon talk about audio over IP and more specifically a protocol within that called Dante. From mm-hmm. a software point of view, does Audition support Dante 
And what benefits, from your perspective, does Dante provide compared to traditional audio cabling? Yeah, Dante has software that emulates uh, audio interfaces. So it's a virtual audio device that Audition, Premiere, other audio applications uh, can access. And as far as the application knows, it thinks it's just another piece of hardware in the chain. But the, the software can communicate um, via these protocols with all of the different uh, hardware options that are out there. Dante is one of several uh, protocols. It, it, I think it's kind of the most popular right now, although it's a little proprietary. But it's, it's effective because it gets rid of, you know, back in the day if we wanted to do a, a remote, remote voiceover uh, recording, you had to go to a studio that had an ISDN connection, and that's expensive, and it's kind of a pain to really go out and use that, and it wasn't necessarily that good. And what uh, audio over IP really lets us do is send full, uncompressed, uh, clean, crystal clear sound, multiple channels of it over network, network cables. So it gets rid of those huge amounts of you know, twisted snakes that get all messed up behind your desks and that you have to reroute through walls and over ceiling tiles, and it just puts them into a single nice and, you know, fiber optic or network cable that you just kind of plug in and offers digital switching, digital patching. You just don't, it's so much more flexible and so much easier than it used to be. So from an operational point of view, if we were using Dante with, with Audition, it's just going to show up as though it was a hardware device, even though it isn't really hardware. It's pretending to be hardware, and we just use it the same as we would any other device? Question? Yeah, well, yeah. We certainly put audio hardware into the, into the settings, and you know, that's maybe now a, a kind of a legacy term. It really should just be audio interface, and whether that's uh, a physical piece of hardware on the desk or inside the, the computer system or a virtual application running that just does the exact same thing but over the network. Um, that's, uh, it's really kind of, uh, changed how that, how that, uh, is presented to, to users and to studios. Well, the cool thing that I discovered about Dante as I was doing some homework for this, this segment is that the machine that's, that's originating the Dante and the machine that's receiving the Dante don't even have to be in the same state. They could be wildly different because it just uses the web for sending the signals, yeah. which just totally redefines yeah. the concept of remote. Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, as long as the bandwidth is there, then you can send. It's amazing how much, uh, how much audio, discrete audio channels you can send over, uh, over those protocols. Another thing that you were interested in is machine learning and how that relates to audio. How does machine learning relate to audio? It's, there's so many possibilities. I, I can tell you what what uh, Adobe has done. What, uh, in our applications so far, okay. um, I can kind of yeah. Well, I'll start with that. So one of the first kind of AI and machine learning based features that that we did here at Adobe um, under our what we call Adobe Sensei as a kind of our, our brand for our AI and machine learning technology was Remix in Audition, which uh, you could load any song. It didn't have to be specially prepared. Any piece of recorded music, uh, and it would analyze it, and it would be able to make remixes whether they're shorter or longer just by dragging the edge of the clip. And they were musically coherent. It could track uh, a lot of different uh, characteristics of that song, harm harmony, phase, rhythm, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was, it's, it's just an amazing little tool that, that can save somebody so much time when they have a, a, a piece of music that's of a, a finite length and they need to very quickly get it to get, you know, get remixes to, to satisfy different lengths, uh, different duration projects. Um, beyond that, we've done uh, some work around auto-ducking, which is, you know, we're all familiar with either keyframing a bunch of volume uh, keyframes in so that the music comes down when somebody's talking and then it comes back up when they stop, um, or, you know, what's called writing the fader where you record the automation and you just kind of sit there and move the volume knob up and down and up and down. And those are great, uh, but they are very manual. You have to do them in real time or, or even slower. And if you start to make changes to your to your timeline, you got to bring you know you got to make all the same changes to the to the automation as well. So we used machine learning to actually look at clips that were tagged as dialogue, look at the content within those clips. So it's not just an in and out point, but the the actual signal inside, the the uh, the emphasis and the and the uh, dynamic range of those clips, 
and adjust and draw those keyframes in for you so that it's not, it's not just a black box where it just turns it all up and down automatically and you don't have any control. It does the busy work of clicking on all those little keyframes and tracking them when you move a clip around. And you can still go in and manually make changes if you want to add your, you know, a, a, a different effect or uh, make some, some, some minor adjustments based on, on the content that maybe in some cases the, the machine learning isn't quite intelligent enough to, to know what you were thinking or what you wanted there. Um, so in some ways, it just saves a lot of time. But let me, let me interrupt for just a second. You've got an audio clip. There's volume in the audio clip. What's the machine learning part? There's either volume or there isn't. There's either the fade up or the fade down. What's the training and, and this whole mystique of training a computer to do something? I'm very confused about that. Well, in the case of auto ducking, it's, uh, it's, more, it's less about understanding what is in the content and more about reducing the busy work so you get to focus on the creative part. You know, you don't have to spend an hour dropping in keyframes and bringing them down and adjusting them just right um, over the course of a few minutes of, of, of a timeline. Um, but uh, with other features, uh, you know, we, we just recently released uh, some new effects around denoise and de-reverb that are also machine learning based. And it's really ways of, of, of having an algorithm that finds patterns um, in really huge data sets um, and being able to change its behavior over time to look to uh, in response to those. But what is the machine learning? Well, it, it depends on, so there's, there's a couple types of machine learning. Um, uh, on, a, on a big scale, there's what's called supervised and unsupervised machine learning. And supervised is where we feed an algorithm a bunch of information that we already know the answer to. And so we say, you know, you could think of it as a math class. Um, the teacher gives uh, an assignment, there's a bunch of problems, and the teacher knows the answers, and you're kind of graded on how well you, you know, how accurately you get the, the correct answers. Whereas unsupervised is more, here's a bunch of, it's more like an art class. Hey, here's a bunch of art supplies, create something. And, and, and learn how they work yourself. And, and then you come back and show me what you, you've done, and then we can kind of guide you, uh, guide the AI, or, or in this case, the art student, into being able to create better and better and, and, and find more and more things to do with those, with those supplies. Hmm. Clearly, <laughs> clearly, I'm going to have to do some more homework to understand it, but it just seems like magic to me. I, um. Duran, there's nobody else listening right now, so I just thought maybe you could give us a clue what Adobe is going to be announcing at NAB. Your secret is oh, safe sure. with I'll me. Just, I'll, just, I'll just run down the list right now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I can't do that. We have uh, lots of marketing and PR folks, and they would be very upset if I uh, broke, the, broke the embargo and, and let things out early. That would um, be... I'll tell you what, you know, what I've said before. Uh, around uh, a lot of what we're doing, you know, we're, we're committed to uh, continuing to improve performance and quality of all of our applications across the board, um, and that's you know that's uh, we we see that as a feature into it unto itself. Um, with regards to say audition specifically, or or working between audition and Premiere, we've been committed to trying to bridge that gap. So between the NLE and the DAW, the, the video editor and the audio editor, and you know we're working toward this this long term vision of getting rid of this idea of interchange, that lossy, you know, uh, lie that we we tell around, you know, picture lock and oh here's here's the project we're done, oh no we made this change we made this change and so, you know it's it, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of extra effort on the part of the uh, uh, the audio producers and, and everybody else involved and so we want to get rid of that idea and just have a product, a project where Premiere or is the best video editor for that project and Audition is the best audio environment for that project, but the project exists and is shared and everybody gets to work together and see those changes in real time. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long road, uh, I think, to get that to that vision, but I think it's going to be worth it when we get there. Well, it's like waiting for Christmas. We have a few more weeks to go before we can learn the secret of what's coming new this spring. For people who want to learn more about Adobe and its creative cloud applications, where can they go on the web? Best place is adobe.com. 
That's all one word in case you've been living under a rock, adobe.com. And Duran Gleaves is the product manager for audio at Adobe. And Duran, thanks for joining us. It is always fun to visit with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Larry. Take care. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. You too. You know, I was just thinking, I attended a seminar this morning at USC that was talking about the fourth industrial revolution. The first was the invention of steam power. The second was the introduction of the assembly line and mass production. The third was the advent of technology. And the fourth is the extension of technology into artificial intelligence, smart machines, and the interconnected Internet of Things. We're seeing this in our daily lives with Siri and Alexa smart speakers, online doorbells and refrigerators, and facial recognition in our photos. As the speaker this morning made clear, we really don't have a clue how this will play out in society or in its impact on jobs. We've talked in the past on The Buzz of the impact of AI extending into the editorial process. We learned more about it tonight as it becomes easier than ever to route audio from anywhere to anywhere using just an Ethernet connection or how machine learning allows us to do amazing things with audio from removing noise to separating vocals from the backing music in a mixed audio clip. And I'm sure we'll see a lot more of this technological magic at NAB in just a few weeks. For some, these are exciting times. For others, these could foreshadow deep changes in society to come. But what this morning's talk made clear is that we can't stop change. Instead, we have to learn how to roll with it and incorporate it into our own lives. As Alvin Toffler said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. We, whose lives are built on technology, need to memorize this and put it into action, because otherwise... If we're unable to forget what we learned and learn something new, we'll become overwhelmed. As Mr. Toffler said, change is the process by which the future invades our lives. Change is inevitable. But in a few weeks at NAB, we'll get the clearest signpost yet of where all this change is taking us. Just something I'm thinking about. I want to thank our guests this week, Bernard Weiser with EIPMA, Paul Isaacs with Sound Devices, Robert Noon with Location Sound, Duran Gleaves with Adobe, and James DeRuvo with DottleNews.com. There's a lot of history in our industry, and it's all posted to our website at DigitalProductionBuzz.com. Here you'll find thousands of interviews, all online and all available to you today. And remember to sign up for our free weekly show newsletter that comes out every Saturday. Talk with us on Twitter at DPBuzz and Facebook at DigitalProductionBuzz.com. Our theme music is composed by Nathan Dookie Turner with additional music provided by SmartSound.com. Our producer is Debbie Price. My name is Larry Jordan, and thanks for listening to the Digital Production Buzz. The Digital Production Buzz is copyright 2019 by Thalo LLC.